Hello, and welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly program where Masons from around the world get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. Let's see, as a reminder, the thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the participants and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions. Make sure you keep your conversations open for the public and on the level. To interact with us, we love seeing you guys live every Thursday night on Facebook and the YouTube land, so hello and good evening. Hop in the chat, send, send a few words, let us know if you agree, disagree. You know, it's good to see you all there, interact with you live. If not, you guys are also certainly welcome to listen to this later or watch the chat replay. So, love you guys. You see, you know me. My name is John Ruark. I'm a past master of the Patriot Lodge, number 1957 in Fairfax, Virginia. A little light crew tonight. The least of which being returning from an international affair, Joe Martinez. Hey, Joe. Hello. Hello. hello interwebs yes hello all you cool cats and kittens uh so happy to be back uh i thought my seat would have gotten replaced by now um so thank you yeah. thank you for we, we keeping kept it around warm. i appreciate it. i was reading the chats uh for the last couple of weeks it was like <laughs> joe got fired joe got fired i was like what the hell um <laughs> i did not get fired i just went on vacation so miss y'all joe martinez uh member of stuff and things many many things i don't even remember half the things um yeah happy to be back you've used up all your pto for the year though so it's it's done gone you burned it's through gone. It. <laughs> three burned weeks through next year too yes yeah. speaking of burning through pto we've also got a special guest <laughs> from a long time ago in a galaxy far far away that is the one the only tmr emeritus nick johnson has been he has been, you know. I, I just for all the listeners there, I do have my uh, standard past masters has been shirt on, and uh, really glad to be back. And uh, you know, now that you've used all your PTO, you could just tell your kids, "Sorry, Christmas is canceled this year." You know. <laughs> womp, so, womp. But, uh, oh man, but womp, uh, yeah, no, great to be back. You know, and uh, getting to getting to hang out with you fellas and talk about the old uh, uh, busting stones. I know, I know. It's it's super cool. I, uh, I think that's what we're calling it. I'm tr you know, I'm trying to stones. keep this fresh. You know, busting stones, breaking. I don't know. Breaking rocks is probably a different thing. That that means you know you're you're somewhere else. You don't want to be working in whatever. the quarries. Yeah. Yes, we'll go with that. There we go. Awesome. Hey, um, before we get to tonight's topic, I want to give a special shout out to the patrons who've been supporting the show. You guys are awesome. So if you want to join our little chat, we've actually. Did a little, tried a little new thing this week, had a, an ongoing chat with all the patrons of the show, um, chatting about our favorite books that we're reading. So if you want to join in on that, head over to patreon.com slash the Masonic Roundtable. Love to see you over there and uh, nerd out for the rest of the week with us. So um, here we are, still in August, still with TMR Alumni Week. And uh, boy, upon popular request, do we have the one and only Nick Johnson back. Um, I think, you know... Uh, for many years after, after your departure was, uh, there were so many requests to, uh, I think, I think that your friend Sheeple actually was more requested than, <laughs> than yourself. Um, where, how's Sheeple doing? That's the, uh, the question everyone wants to know. Unfortunately, he's still in my basement. He's still living <laughs> here. You know, seriously, he's unemployed. I mean, he's looking for opportunities is what he said to <laughs> spread the truth that's that's what he's told me anyway and uh hopefully he'll uh he said that uh he's finally gotten a call back i'm assuming it's oh, from good. alex jones but uh, <laughs> you know it's uh we're hoping we're hoping that this this might be the one mm. uh, this might be the one get him out of the house get a real job well, i mean well you know i mean if, if he would stop eating all of my uh goldfish you know because it's him versus his nephews and like <laughs> Doritos yeah. and Mountain Dew, yeah. You can't get rid of family. I mean, family's great. It's uh, you know, <laughs> it keeps us together somehow. Oh. So, so what have you been up to? Like, what's uh, how's the past couple of years been for you? Oh man, well, you know, it's been it's been interesting because uh, you know, as as I'm sure many of you know, a a certain uh, viral thing started floating through uh, the world, from what I understand, and. Uh, so everything went online and you know being involved in a lot of a lot of the invitational side bodies um 
the one the one nice thing was we did have a lot of flexibility at that at in those particular bodies uh, to be able to go online, uh, and you know just just develop kind of a cadence on what are we going to do for next year and. Um, you know, it's one of those that now that we've come out of, well, for the most part, come out of the pandemic, you know, it's one of those that uh, I'm currently the excellent chief of the Minnesota Council of Night Masons. And with that has come the, you know, the interesting challenge of what do we do with all of these people that we had in waiting to take degrees. And as you can imagine, you know, a body that's invitational you're you're actively act uh, asking these people to join and because they're actively joining with us um you know we've extended out to them so really the impetus on getting them in is on us in in toto right we have to do this and so you know it's been kind of a challenge to really work that through understanding you know that some people you know we're we're still kind of under those uh, under those rules but not really you know i think a lot of things have softened up and gotten easier and so right now it's really trying to you know look at our numbers understand how many people you know we need to talk to for dues how many people and mm -hmm. you know especially in the invitational bodies you're dealing with people that are for the most part active but you know they're not always um mm -hmm. You know they're 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 involved in so many different things, and especially you know the, mm. the pandemic. The one thing that it, it offered to people was the idea that they could essentially do a reset, right? So a lot of people oh, yeah. discovered that hey, maybe we don't want to be a part of the York right. You know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, especially the York right bodies. You know, they they have taken a hit that that a lot of the other bodies have not, just because you know, I mean, it's three deuce checks plus, you know, what you know, what, what are we doing essentially is, yeah. is what they've dealt with. And so mm -hmm. you've got that going on and it's just been kind of interesting. I haven't joined anything. Um, well, I was going to ask like, what's the net sword count? Is it net positive, uh, net negative? <laughs> you know, now that you net positive. <laughs> yeah, hold on. Now I've got to think. Be net positive. See, now I got, now I got to think. Cause did I join something while I was, no, I didn't. I was not allowed to, but oh. <laughs> I could have. <laughs> I could have joined something, um, and actually, you know, for for everybody who's listening, you know, it looks like this year is going to be the final, finally, the year after many years of doing this masonry th uh, thing. Since I've been doing it since 2006, uh, I'll be joining the Scottish Rite. Oh wow! Mm, I thought so... you were like work or die, baby. Oh man, northern well, or southern. If... Uh, Southern, yeah. So luckily, oh. you know, it, it, it. Welcome to the, the the oddity that is Minnesota. Boy, um, this is, yeah, you know, the, the river. The river literally runs through it. Like, you know, the river is what <laughs> decides if you're north or south, even though we're east and west. But, um, and you know, the the most fascinating thing, especially in Minnesota, because like Scottish right. I think it's all the way back to like when it started. We had ATC Pearson is the father of Minnesota Freemasonry, guided everything. And he actually was the one who spoke with, we were going to be Northern Masonic jurisdiction. Then Pike grabbed him in Chicago and said, hey, 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 just, just a thought, right? And so literally, you know, it was one of those types of meetings that decided kind of where the bo the boundary of this whole thing would be so that's interesting you know it's it's yeah it's kind of an interesting thing mm. and, and especially in minnesota you know i think also because of the theater culture here you know minneapolis scottish right is doing all 29 degrees <laughs> i never forgot that i'm super yeah. jealous yeah and they do it twice a year so it's two degrees every week so it's right night mm. and then saint paul which is literally eight miles from that one is doing like 22 of the degrees wow and yeah. duluth is doing like 19 road rochester trip? does like 18 joe if you, you want to road yeah. trip? let's do it i Got mean you'll have to share a room man. with sheeple yeah yeah, yeah. yeah that's true pass. for the east coast hard pass mm -hmm. hard pass yeah yeah well i mean you know sheeple he, he he'll share room i don't know he might <laughs> He might He'll talk bunk. your ear off constantly. I can listen. I can tell you from having people in my house that gorge on goldfish, uh, especially when they come home from school, they're not good bathers. 
they don't bathe. You know, you got that goldfish no. crust all up in the fingernails and stuff. Oh, no boy, nice. No. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Finger looking good. See, that's why you got to go with the multicolor ones because then you know at least they've got like the orange and the green and the yellow all together. It just kind of makes it makes it a little bit easier to recognize. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this wasn't a family friendly show. Yeah, and and by the way, before we we get into the topic too, um, there's been a request on the Facebook stream um, to see if there's a Masonic Monday question on Thursday Ooh. Ooh. that that you could uh, you could regurgitate. So think of a good one while we while we talk while we vamp. Hundred percent. And that way, you, uh, the answer you have to blow it up because this is the the benefit of watching live. You get to answer it in either the YouTube or the Facebook chats. We got them off to the side here. So um, first one to get it right wins uh, one of Nick's swords. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you the bet one. <laughs> the... There's a joke in there somewhere. So let's go right over to the topic that you wanted to talk about tonight. Uh, this was, yeah. topic was chosen by Nick uh, about a recent book that he's read called The Intelligence Trap. Why smart people make dumb mistakes. So obviously it doesn't apply to Freemasonry at all whatsoever. But imagine if it did, what was that? What would that look like? Why do smart people, smart men in the fraternity make uh, dumb mistakes occasionally? And so we'll cover a little bit about that. So um, what led you to want to talk about this book, Nick? You know, yeah. So, you know, it's been interesting, you know, especially during all of this, this very huge change and kind of dealing with everything and you know because of the situation that we've been through for the last three years you know it's been interesting to see where grand lodges grand bodies and you know i, I would say grand bodies in general national bodies have, have struggled mightily and i think it's because a lot of them you know a lot of the folks that get up to those levels are very smart. I mean, they, they've gotten there through the hard work, but also, you know, understanding a lot of what we're doing. But I think <laughs> there's, there's that, that potential, that possibility with which, you know, you lose, you lose the ground by not understanding and assuming that you know more. Right. And I, and I've noticed right. that especially now, you know, I mean, it's, it's been, it's been a struggle watching, you know, watching kind of the interaction between lodges and um, grand lodges and grand bodies and their subordinate bodies. And, you know, I, I was reading this book and, you know, just to kind of give you, give the, the listeners the, you know, the, the book title um, is, let me grab that for you. I have my bookmarks in here. So that's that, of course, that's how, you know, I'm trying to screw up all of the audio for this, just just so that John has to do a lot of editing later on. We'll fix it uh, first. We appreciate you. Yeah, we, we love everything you do, and uh, so it's by David Robson. Um, it's called "The Intelligence Trap: Why Smart People Make Stupid Mistakes." That's what John just said. But you know, it's one of those that I, I was reading through this book just because on a whim I had listened to. Uh, Robson on a couple of different podcasts because, you know, as an avid podcast listener, um, especially to this show, uh, you know, you, I was listening to the way in which he was describing these different examples, and we can go through just a couple of them because um, I think they really do um, highlight just how confusing intelligence can be, right? You know, IQ oh, yeah. has been an under you know we we've spoken about iq for you know i don't know what is it a, a at least a century and a half right iq has been mm -hmm. the focus right and the thing is is iq is only only useful if it's used properly and oftentimes those who have a, a high level of iq are usually ones that also have huge blind spots especially right. own understanding you know, and I think that happens a lot in our own Masonic bodies, even at the local level, right? And, you know, he says in his book, you know, and I'll just quote from it, uh, intelligent and educated people are less likely to learn from their mistakes, for instance, or take advice from others. Um, 
and when they do err, they are better able to build elaborate arguments to justify their reasoning, meaning they become more and more dogmatic in their views. Worse still, they appear to have a bigger bias blind spot, meaning they are less able to recognize the holes in their logic. And, you know, I, I think all of us have seen this in our own yeah. work. Well, that, that's what, yeah, that's what he, uh, what I got from that, what you said, Nick, was, that's when he was Robson was talking a lot about motivated reasoning where, you know, basically these really, and the examples he gives are, are awesome. And I know you're going to touch on them, but where you apply this awesome amount of intelligence or brain power to support an argument, whether it's, it's good or if it's crap, it's just, you know, it goes to that bias that you talk about. Um, and again, it's, it's really highlighted by some super interesting examples of people you would not think would fall into that. So I, I just found that super interesting. Uh, in what I saw. Yeah, I was going to add to that and say that um, <clears throat> some of this also goes back to some of our uh, our cognitive biases or logical fallacies uh, episodes we've done where you know, they, they emphasize this quite a bit. It's a relatively new book, so it builds on a lot of some of the other books on psychology and, and, and biases where you have things like confirmation bias where you're only going to find things that support your, your uh, presuppositions, right? Or... Um, you have the Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, which is a documented um, behavior where people tend to overestimate their abilities, right? The, the higher up in an organization the manager is, probably the less competent they really are. But they think they're really competent, right? Yeah, and yeah. I think if how you, that applies. If you think, exactly. If you think you're competent, then you are suffering from the Dunning-Kruger effect. And if you think you are not competent, you are also suffering from the Dunning-Kruger exactly. effect. Exactly, you know? yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And so there was a line in the book, just to get right to it, that, that really kind of, I had to repeat it a couple times because it was really fascinating, where he says something along the lines of that, um, oh, crap, I lost, I lost my point because it was really good. I know I'll get to it. So... Let's talk about uh, the Dunning Kruger effect in in how it applies to, say, the Grand Lodge or the or the you know these district education officers, for example. That's where my mind went. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think you know it's it's interesting that you know a lot of like you know, and I'll use an example, uh, just a Masonic example, um, which is you know in a lot of Grand Lodge, Grand actually Grand bodies in general, um, the Grands are very hesitant to create new Masonic bodies. They are they will literally fall within the sunk cost fallacy, right? Of just trying to save bodies in different places or move Yes. You know, and in and, and, and some in, in you know and and kind of the, the colloquial term for it is capture the flag where they'll literally move a body from one place to another instead of saying and instead perhaps maybe we should just start something new here. Yeah, the sunk cost fallacy being where, you know, you're so invested in literally in the past that the best decision may be to stop it, but you want to keep going just because I've already gone gone this far and spent this much time and effort. Well, to yeah. to that point, and and just to just to throw this at Nick, um, because I've I've seen this at at a local level, um, to the point where people either think you're not a team player or you're not helpful because you don't subscribe to that sort of mentality. And I'll give you a perfect Ooh, example. Interesting. Um, and I, I know there's people listening that, that subscribe to this. Um, we uh, went to, oh, it was a commandry meeting. And in that commandry meeting, we had the conversation of, hey, this commandry down the road is really struggling. They haven't been able to open in months. Uh, they have a hard time getting guys out. So we're going to go next Tuesday or whatever, and we're going to go help them open and help them build themselves back up and this, that, and the other thing. And, you know, people are raising their hands. Yeah, I'll totally go. I'll totally help. And this, that, and the other thing. And the first thing I said was, I'm like, why? Like if they haven't been <laughs> right. able to open in X number of months or X number of years and they can't get their own stuff together, why do we feel the need to be that life support? Just let them die. Like, why is that a bad thing? You know, and apparently it is because, you know, you get the, the shocked eyebrows and the uh, offensive comments in the in the coffee room after. So. How Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's how almost as I? if you're talking about, how, you know, we need to 
how how could you possibly want grandpa to die right i mean that's that's how it, it almost seems and it's like yeah it's, it's really that's... not that right but they they believe it so much because you know a lot of mm-hmm. these guys have sunk years into it right and or or there's a perception even it's not even that it's actually true because you know a body that barely gets seven in right i mean that means that there's only really seven people offering any effort to it but especially those that are at a district level perhaps or uh higher than that are are thinking to themselves well if we close this then something is going to happen right like as in nothing will happen and it will die and you know that's that's kind of the issue especially you know in a lot of states, including mine, um, you know, we have a lot of, especially within the code itself, we have a lot of protectionist language for lodges, whereby a lodge will, uh, to to make a lodge disappear is actually far easier than to give birth to a new lodge, which, you know, I mean, that's kind of confusingly odd, right? Because you would think if you're trying to create something new right you would expect the rules for birth and death to be equal right and they aren't and you know that's yeah and that's just one of many you know and it's because there's a protection is like we we must ensure that this is here and you know as as it gets further and further that bias gets stronger and stronger until it becomes almost in and of itself a custom or a law and, well, to that point, and and this is a question for you, Nick. Is it is it a society thing, or is it a geographic thing? And the reason why I ask, you brought up something, and and here at least uh, in, in the jurisdictions I'm a member of, you're right. It's an absolute nightmare to try and create something new, whether it's a lodge or what have you. Um, while it's very easy to to turn in a charter and and close one out, whereas if you go overseas, you go to Europe. Um, they're starting new lodges every week, right? They have, you know, 20 to 25 guys. If it gets bigger than that, let's, let's look at the UK, for example, if you have lodges of more than 35, 40 people, they can, they think they have too many people in the lodge and they need to break off and start something new, right? Whereas, you know, if you don't have 200 dues paying members on your roster, something's wrong with you. Um, so I, again, I think there's a bit of how people grew up and how people were raised and the sociological aspects of it. And I think we're, as Americans, um, we're kind of, we kind of follow that mindset that you're talking about where you can't let grandpa die, as you said. Um, exactly. Hold that, and and hold you're that absolutely, you're absolutely, yeah, you're absolutely correct on that. And actually there are grand lodges that are starting to figure that out. I think in some respects, you know, a lot of, a lot of this is emotional, right? And actually he mentions that as well, right? Um, in the book and I'll pull that up, but you know, a lot of these things are emotional. So there are actually people or, or I mean, jurisdictions that are changing that mindset, right? Where they are actually um, actively changing those rules. California, I believe is one. Um, Hawaii is another, you know, they're making it far easier to start new things or to encourage more activity in that kind of respect. And, you know, I think that's, that's something that we, you know, really need to push forward with, uh, because, you know, I, it is, it's, you know, we, we need to get away from our, our former prejudices of, you know, just, and it's not just, we've always done it this way. It's actually, I think even worse than that. It's like, we've fallen into a trap, right? Essentially, you know, of how do we get ourselves out of here? And I, and you know, yeah, exactly. You know, I'm, I'm selling this guy's book like hard. I hope I get some. some well, okay. So I do, royalties, I, do remember, man. I do remember the second <laughs> point I was, I was trying to make earlier. Finally, finally, finally which was uh, the, the, the quote that he said was basically along the lines of wait for it, Joe. It's good. It's worth it. Uh, basically how we overestimate the knowledge that we used to have, not the knowledge we have today. And that, that took me for a pause because I was like, okay, wait a minute. Like, I know I'm guilty of that. But then when I try to apply that to masonry, that really blew my mind. Because think about all these past masters, right, that had had, that had worked really hard for their year or had even gone on and done things like been on 
you know, Grand Lodge committees or have been, uh, especially for ritual, right? They used to be great at ritual. And so we hold them and they ha hold themselves at this really super high standard, even if it's not really true today. <clears throat> and um, their, you know, their abilities or capabilities might be less today than they were, you know, back in the 80s when they were in their, their prime. And yet we still hold them psychologically at this higher pedestal which can actually have a negative impact for the craft. And I, exactly. Mm. Mm. Exactly. Like and that. you know, and, and, yeah, and the, and the quote that he has, you know, and I think this is probably the, one of the ones is, all of this would seem to chime with research showing that beliefs may first arise from emotional needs, and it is only afterward that the intellect kicks in to rationalize the feelings, however bizarre they may be. And, you know, during, and in the book, he's actually talking about Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who yes. you know, he literally developed, you know, the man of intellect, right? Of just blind intellect. Deduction. Sherlock Holmes. Deduction, you know, and, you know, it's like we're going to, you know, do everything scientifically. There is not going to be one, th you know, thought outside of what is rational. And he was also a huge proponent of seances, you know, and he was tricked by two young ladies who had said that they had taken pictures of fairies. Yeah, Photoshop fairies. Is, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like old uh, Victorian era Photoshop. And he fell down the trap. And, you know, I mean, you know, they point to the very famous example. I mean, I think a Drunk History episode was about this where, you know, you had Houdini who absolutely enjoyed you know, destroying, you know, the seance movement. He hated right. spiritualism more than anything on the planet. And, you mm -hmm. know, but he was also friends with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. <laughs> and he, you know, had his, uh, Conan, Do uh, uh, Conan Doyle's wife said that she spoke to spirits and all this other stuff. And he said, all right, all right, I'll listen. And she's all of a sudden gets magical messages that his mother is, that Houdini's mother is talking back from the grave. And, you know, on the piece of paper, you know, they're writing down all these things and it's all 20 pages of notes, just thick notes of all the things I love you, sweetheart, blah, blah, blah. And the funny part was, is Houdini's mother did not speak English. Not a word. <laughs> not one word. And she, and, and in all of these notes, it was, I've, I've met the heavenly Lord with Jesus Christ and all this stuff. Houdini is Jewish. Right. <laughs> and it was quite confusing to Houdini that his Jewish mother, who spoke not one word of English, would spend 20 pages talking about Christian belief in English. But Conan Doyle, even after Houdini explained that to him, had a giant bias in his mind saying, I know what you're saying, but I'm not going to listen because I don't think you're right yeah so that leads to yeah a lot of the premise of the book leading to this intelligence trap which is the fact that even if you are fairly intelligent you have a high iq you've done a lot of hard work for for freemasonry um when you are confronted with something that challenges those beliefs whether it be your tradition's not working right we need to try something different because it's not working what do we do? We apply the backfire effect and we double down. We say, well, no, I can't be wrong. It must be you that's wrong and you're ugly too, right? Like you actually double down on your, you're trying to, to find a rational uh, explanation, just like uh, you know, brother Sir Arthur Conan Doyle did, right? Trying to find a, a, some sort of scientific or logical reason for fairies and for, you know, the, the explanation of these seances. And so, when, when confronted with counterfactual arguments, like what we find is that people generally tend to really, well, I'm smart. Why, why are you challenging me? I, obviously, there's got to be some explanation that confirms my priors. Joe? No, I, I think you're spot on. And, and all I kept thinking about was, uh, as you were saying that, was how often do we see that? And, you know, how much is it really everybody at every level of masonry is a wonderful beautiful individual and i love them from the bottom of my heart but but there's a but um how much of it is really that what what nick was talking about and what we're talking about in this book versus just 
I'm scared to death of change and I won't want to change. It has nothing to do with my intelligence. It has to do with the fact that I don't want to change because there is no change that needs to happen. Right. So, and they're not applying that the, the intelligent part of their faculties, they're just, it's just pure emotion and stubbornness and, you know, an inability to, to want to change. So I'm, I'm going through my mental Rolodex of people. I'm like, how much of them follow that, you know, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle mentality, um, which is really highlighted well in this book. Um, we better get royalties for this, Nick. This is ridiculous. I mean, how many times we're, we're saying the word book? I mean, um, seriously, he robs it. Like some audi audible credits or something. Something, you know. But, um, you know, and how much of it is just that 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 vapid surface level, I'm not going to do anything because I don't want to do anything. I'm not going to rock the boat. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, you know, the thing is, uh, even within our fraternity, we, we focus on the mentorship idea, right? I mean, we use it constantly, right? I mean, we love the word mentorship, right? I mean, it's it's something that I'm, I'm surprised that it's not another degree. I mean, I'm surprised it's not something that we have to take at a grand the, launch. The NMJ is listening. Um, right. Strike I mean, that from you know, the transcript yeah. now. All right. um, yeah, we'll so, fix it in post. Uh, but, <laughs> well, and the thing is, what's so interesting, too, though, is like the idea of mentor, right, who was the the uh, man that Odysseus chose, right, to watch his son Telemachus while he was in, you know, while he was off fighting, you know, the Trojan War, you know, mentor was both very useful as a father figure, but also kind of useless and that's why it's so interesting that we focus so much on the concept of you know mentor and mentorship you know well and yet in in the the book the odyssey it's not so much telemachus doesn't figure out that he needs to jump up and get ready and fight until his own father shows up right i mean it's literally his own relation that his his father himself that shows up before he figures it out. So I think I think sometimes we put too much emphasis and focus on this idea of the mentor, right? And sometimes we overestimate even the ability of a mentor to properly teach. Because what are the qualifications to be a Masonic mentor? None. Oh. Still looking. Uh, alert. Gray None. hair. <laughs> 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 we're there. We're there. But funnily enough, Nick's example is really interesting because it wasn't mentor who provided that guidance. It was a woman. It was the Greek goddess yeah. Athena who actually Athena. provided the wisdom and the guidance. Um, don't test you know, Joe on his Greek knowledge. So, yeah. Don't, don't, yeah. Don't try. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Athena was there. She would come in and uh, – and create the figure of mentor and actually do the actual teaching because mentor was mm -hmm. kind of useless. I mean, you know, all the suitors were wandering around the house in Ithaca, you know, and he's just like, oh, how, how am I supposed to do? I mean, they're all here, you know, and that's, yeah. and that's just, yeah, exactly. And that, and that's who we name the people that are to teach us. Mentor. <laughs> nice. Mentor. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's the other thing is, you know, in the book at the very end of it, they, they focus on the, the group you know what what you can do in a group to really improve that um the the not just the cohesion because you know that's always one focus but like the ability to make better decisions and think better right Good. and it's not yep. about yeah and it's not about intellectual like it doesn't no. matter if you're the, you yeah yeah that it's meaningless to have full iq that you know this is going to be sacrilegious but they actually found that that groups that were more evenly spread between men and women as a single group actually performed better on those tasks than ones that were all men or all women, which was, I found very interesting. Um, you know, and that's, that's the other, that's the other thing is that they found that a lot of this, what we, we call soft skills, which I think he appropriately kind of attacks as it's interesting that we make them sound almost weak ineffective right but these skills of you know communication of finding you know agreement amongst the group without those you can have you can have einstein with his messy desk or whomever it doesn't matter you can have them all together it won't matter to make a good decision as much as if you have the cohesiveness whereby everyone can make a decision together so I think that brings up an interesting point uh, that I wanted to highlight. So a couple of years ago, I found this quote that really kind of 
broke my head in, in a good way, right? And so I want to kind of pass this on to you. But to, to preface it, um, if you're listening to this, I want you to think about a belief that you hold very, very strongly, whether it be political, whether it be uh, religious, um, medicine, whatever it is, right? What is this one, this, just one idea that you're like, boy, this, everyone else is wrong and I know I'm right on this one, okay? So think about it. You got it? Okay, so now the next step is, is this question that broke my head that says, okay, what piece of information, what piece of new information could be provided to you that would make you change your mind? That could let you, make you let go of that belief? What is that one piece of evidence or one piece of data or one something that would actually give you new evidence that would, that would change your mind? So the first step is, if your answer is, well, nothing, move on, right? That means you're not a logical, rational human being. You're, it's all emotional. It's 100% emotional, um, which is possible, right? We're all human beings. We're, we, we, have, we have that, that uh, fallibility as part of our being. But if you can say, okay, well, if, you know, if I had a piece of evidence that proved I'm making this up on the spot, if I, if I you know, being a Christian, if I knew that, that God completely didn't exist, there was some piece of evidence that could change my mind and say that God didn't exist, then would I change my mind? Then, you know, then I have to say, well, how would I react to that? And how would I make a better, a different decision based off of that data? Right. Or what would I do in that case? And that's hard. That's hard for people to do because of everything we talked about in the beginning of this episode of we, we look for things that confirm our biases. We look for things that confirm our viewpoint of the world. We go to Facebook groups that align with our current thinking, right? We, we hang out with people similar to us, maybe not in shape and size and color, but at least of intellectual groupthink. So the goal here is to think about if presented with clear contradicting evidence of whatever that belief is, could you change your mind and like what would how would you be able to handle that emotionally rationally socially emotionally and that then leads to a whole bunch of other questions about well how do we break out of this intelligence trap because if we know this is the way human beings are we, we've heard sir, you know, sir arthur conan doyle get sucked into this he doubled down but let's talk about this because i think one way to get over that hump one way to fix the fact that we are in this intelligence trap is to actually as nick was about to to lead us into really talk about making data-driven decisions and i'm you know that's whether you call it you know just just trying something new and getting new data getting new information um you know, letting go of tradition for the sake of, of new and better ideas or whatever that is we've really got to be able to be wrong that's the first step uh, in, in organizational dynamics. It's called intellectual humility. So that's a good term to go Google. Intellectual humility, realizing that I as the leader, I as the worshipful master of this lodge could be wrong. Holy smokes, like how dare you say that? We give you the hat, we give you the gavel. No, 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 no. Have the intellectual humility to, to realize you might not have all the answers. You could be wrong. Or here's, here's something that's really awesome to say as a leader. I, I don't, don't know. know. Joe knew the answer. Yeah. Or, or saying, well, I, I, all I know is that I know nothing. Right? Boom. Boom. You, you've reached enlightenment level 100. So crazy. We'll so we'll proud. We'll see you at episode 500. You are done for the decade, my friend. No, it's really, no, that's, that's spot on. And I mean, I, I, that's the first thing I always say, um, you know, no matter whether I was a, a leader or a follower, no matter what position, I do not know, but I will try my damnedest to get you the answer. Um, you know, and that's, that, that's the journey. Um, but I think that, you know, you, you touch on something really interesting because I think for a lot of these things, um, and, and Dobson does give a couple of examples of it, but for a lot of these things, it's not driven around data, right? Um, at all it's all driven around emotion right so that's where you know, to nick's point that's where that bias starts um i mean let's look at einstein's i'm not going to give it away because just get the book and read it we'll get our audible credits and our royalties will be good <laughs> but um but you know really quick from a high level einstein super genius right the genius of the 20th century right the man knew everything he intuited 
from his intuition, he came up with the special and general theories of relativity, right? Just from thinking the stuff up. I mean, who does that? But, you know, his big claim to fame in this book is that he, what was it, 20 or 30 years? Um, it was definitely more than two decades that he spent trying to disprove quantum mechanics. Because why? Because he thought it was messy and he did not like it. And that was it. That was the only because, reason. Because it felt wrong. Because it felt wrong. So the man spent a quarter, more than a quarter of his life trying to disprove something because he did not like it. Think about that. Think about it for a second, though. Because there are some things in masonry that we don't like because they feel wrong. Not because they are wrong, but because they feel wrong. Whether a grand lodge or a grand line or a grand master might say or do some things because they can't do that. That's, that doesn't feel right. We have to donate to the charity. I mean, we have, we have to. to. <laughs> rah, rah, have or to whatever it's out. called. R-A-R-A needs, the, the, needs the, our yearly check because the, we have to. The full page ad is not going to print itself. Full page ad, baby. Exactly. I mean, and you know, you're absolutely right. And you know, the other thing too is that, you know, and, and he describes it in a kind of a roundabout way where it's, you know, an openness to experience, right? Where you have to be open right you have to like just like you're saying john you know you have to be open to it it's not just and it it, it is data driven but it's also you have to be open to accepting those results once you find it out oh right, right. you have to actually accept it <laughs> yeah you can't just you can't just go into the emotional uh badger you know badger cave and just you know back yourself in and say well just because i heard it doesn't mean i care right and, <laughs> You know, and, you know, and that's just it. I mean, and the thing is, I mean, we know, we know these guys, and and, you know, I, and I get it too. I think you know, emotionally, just like we've talked about, these guys have. I mean, they've kept the lights on during a time when, you know, we quite literally saw the decline of this fraternity to literally its nadir point, right? I mean, literally, we are at the point in which we have the lowest population since we recorded yeah. that right? right i mean even mm -hmm. the anti-masonic period had it better right Ooh, you know i mean that's and that's you know right i mean even the anti-masonic period we still had more freemasons than we kind of do now right and you know and that's and that's because and so we have these guys who are making emotional decisions they're not making decisions and you know but i i i do think and you know we've been we've been kind of harping on them right saying what what aren't you doing right right and i do think though that there are grand lodges that we're seeing now and grand bodies i'm even on a, a membership committee now that we're actually saying perhaps instead of saying we're going to do this thing and it'll magically work perhaps we ask the membership what they want Ooh. right and what? you know i mean and that's the that thing is... is like you know maybe we should ask the, the sir knights if sorry nick your like connection's breaking up that that's something's wrong something's wrong oh, too man. much I, 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 too much common sense there oh, oh god the grand encampment's gonna find me i mean but uh, you know that's the thing right it's like nobody expects being, the grand encampment uh, i'm being targeted no the grand encampment is going to be quiet for the next couple of years so yeah exactly well it's gonna be exactly. nice and but quiet. uh oh, be so keep it on the nice. dl but uh and you know that's the thing though is right is like Sir Knights, I mean, I would love for somebody to ask me, do you like doing the Marchy March? Because you know what I'm going to tell you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Especially because, and, and here's here's a fun little fact for all you future Sir Knights, because honestly, the degrees are fantastic. I'm never going to say no to that, right? However, when you are trapped in an inspection where you have, did you know that there are several uniformed service uh, organ uh, service services in the United States uh, and they all march differently how do I know because I've heard them all yell at each other <laughs> about how they are doing it wrong <laughs> I can only imagine there. the sidelines oh, at your let me tell you, it's I love watching the Marines yelling at the Army that then the Army is yelling at the Marines and then the Navy is looking at them and the Air Force are just crossing their arms I mean it's it's every single inspection. It's terrible and glorious because it also is very old guys doing that, right? Where they all also have very thick soled shoes because of, you know, sciatica. And uh, so, so tuxedo, tuxedos and sneakers. 
Oh, love that's it. my fave. It's so true. And so, you know, and that's the thing is I would love to have a body ask me those things because, and I do, I think, you know, the, the Grand Lodge of Minnesota finally, you know, we, we, we hit that, we hit that point of terror, right. Where we went under 10,000. All right. I mean, that's, that's the point in which terror sets in. Right. And they actually started listening. Right. Now I, I wish that we hadn't Good. had to get to a point where, of, you know, terror right. is the, is the motivator. Right. Again, mo- emotional yeah. response. Right. I mean, that, that's going to be most of the organizations I think, you know, are going to just look at the numbers every year. They're, they're still declining and there will be a, an inflection point where we have to change, not because we want to change. Is it somewhere around 2040? You know, 2040, hashtag 2040. Hashtag 2040. Hashtag 2040. There you go. Yeah, yeah. And you know, you're right though. I mean, and, and they're going to have to hit like it. And sadly, it seems that because they do think within an emotional framework, right, that it's the emotional response is the only way we're going to get something to occur. I mean, that's the sad part. But at the same time, I think there is a break. I think people are breaking finally and saying, you know, maybe we need to start grabbing data. Maybe we need to start thinking a little bit more broadly, like perhaps allowing lodges to meet in homes or allowing them to meet in private yeah. rooms. Yeah, I think that's a good yeah. point. Is like, and, and I've said this before on the show, is like, I'm a big fan of like, we have to experiment with, you know, because there's no, like people say, John, you've done a lot of research into the membership statistics. What is it? What's the magic solution? I'm like, there is no magic solution because as as Nick Johnson says, masonry is provincial, right? So the only way to fix that is you have to experiment with what works in your local area, what works in, because what works for Nick's lodge is going to be different than Joe's lodge and different than my lodge. And so the ability and, and quickness in which we can experiment, not innovate, but experiment with, you know, incremental changes to the structure, the formation, the formality of Freemasonry, that's what's going to save it because there is no one magic bullet that's going to solve the whole thing. Absolutely. Well, and you know, the thing is, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Well, you know, the thing is, though, it's so funny is that our rules, you know, I've actually taken a look at our rules, at least in Minnesota from the 1850s, right? So 1856, 1857, you could literally fit those on two index cards. It's very short. And I think wow. that's the other thing, too, is that it's detritus that uh, that just accumulates over and over and over. Exactly. And let me tell you, I bet you have your Joby's bo- uh, uh, manual there, of, of which there's like three binders, it's a, it's right? Chapter one. Well, my, my, yeah, my daughter's a rainbow girl, and they're, they're just as yeah. prolific. So, yeah, yes, yeah. lots it, to read, that's lots what, to read. That's what scared me off from uh, helping out with Joby's because, you know, the the rules themselves were so thick that it was like, you know, I don't know if I have time to read all this. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, you know, yep. that's the thing, though, is that we have to experiment. And really, when you think about it, when we started, our rules were extremely Yeah, extremely they're guidelines, narrow. they're boundaries, yeah. not, not thou shalt nots or thou shalt do's. Yeah. They were... Okay, just don't don't go outside these bounds. Everything inside, go nuts, and that's the way it should be. That's how you promote yeah. change and innovation and creativity and passion. Flexibility. You're right, exactly. Yeah. Not yeah. Uh, if you just want to, you know, turn the crank and just crank out the same masons and have no independent thoughts or or independent ideas. Ugh, then that's a different fraternity. That's a different yeah. timeline that I don't want to be on. See, organizations that are growing don't have time to know what the rules are, and organizations that are dying only care about the rules. I mean, that's that's kind of the thing, you know. And, it's kind of and, like the MCU multiverse, right? Where yeah. I would, I, you know, Nick, I, that, I've I've been converted since you've been on on the show. All I'm all into the MCU now. So, um, oh boy! So now I get all really? your jokes. Yeah. Even even uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, boy. Even boy, that, yeah. that one. yeah. I haven't watched the boy. She-Hulk yet, but you know that'll oh, be boy. later tonight. That one's fantastic. Although I've been watching way too much, like just uh, shockingly, a lawyer like Sh- She-Hulk. Oh. Okay. Well, <laughs> see, that's what I love that one. And then I found out that originally they were going to turn that particular show into a, a complete trial from beginning to end kind of show, like the staircase. Ooh. But they changed it. 
it to this one, which I think is better. I okay. think it's better because the staircase. I, this is TV talk on, uh, on uh, the dial, but <laughs> anyway, staircase, fantastic show, haunting. But uh, there you go. That's the that's the TLDR. So just nice. just fast forward. But uh, no, I think yeah, it's it's one of those that we we do focus so much on these. <sighs> And it's past knowledge, right? I mean, we, we assume that those before us have accumulated that knowledge and made it and, and, and knew the mistakes, right? But oftentimes, you know, and especially something that I think an exercise that everybody who is a Mason here should do is to actually watch your code, right? Or your constitution or your Amin Raisin, right? And just look at the changes that have occurred in that document from its very founding to now. And you will notice a pattern whereby the rules become stayed and they become extremely repugnant to change. They are they find change to be the most repugnant idea on the planet. And it's fascinating because you could literally see the very beginnings going, we were founded by Noah and ta-da, right? Of course, to now Egypt. Where it's like, yeah. yeah, exactly. Now it's, and you cannot give to charity except on the third Monday, and you must file in your check on the third Tuesday. And it's like, but that was stuff. I don't even know what this is related right. to. Right? Exactly. I mean, it was an old accountant thing from their original firm 35 years ago that they got rid of 25 years ago, but it still remains in the books. And so we all turn in our checks on the third Monday of the third, seventh, whatever. <laughs> it doesn't and matter. And and none of them have online access to their banks. That's no, the best no, part. no, no PayPal allowed. Hey, so <laughs> Nick, we're at that time. Uh, anything else you want to say about the book or, or the thoughts that you had that we didn't get the chance to cover? Because now we're at that, that no, special uh, time of know, the show. I, yeah, the only thing I can think of is that actually we, you know, I I am pretty confident, you know, and I you know I I like to end these things where I, you know I'm, I'm having discussions with people and say that I actually do feel like a change is occurring, right? I do have some confidence in that because yeah. I'm seeing it even right now. You know, the, the, the membership is finally being listened to. Um, I I'm seeing leaders that are less obsessed with like what the past has taught them and more looking to those in the group. Um, it's less of an older generation telling newer generation and more of a, we all have something important to provide and to present to the group to make it better. And so I do have some confidence in that. Um, I think I think we are gonna be needing to be much more focused and ready to push that as much as we can, because if we don't, it will just, um, it, you know, we want, we, we have them on the ropes, I guess is a nice and nasty way of putting it, but, you know, we have the ability to change this now because the, the emotional response is, is is very present so that and also i'd say read the book especially that the final i'd say the final fifth of the book because it focuses a lot on the group idea and how to avoid group think while ah, also good. making the uh, the the concept of group you know where where the knowledge of the group is enhanced and the group think is is um made lighter i think that's that's the one other thing i would say is absolutely read that that book sweet <clears throat> awesome well hey nick uh this has been super cool it's been awesome yeah, to have you back on the show um it's oh uh, did you want to did you want a question masonic yes. monday question on thursday i have one if you'd like on thursday go ahead all right so uh Blow up the, the chat question. guys all right, you guys ready? All right, the Scottish Rite of, the, of Freemasonry is one of the most famous 33rd degree systems in the world. Even profanes know of the 33rd degree. However, it isn't the only one. This Masonic body, founded in England sometime in the 1770s, consisted of 33 nominal degrees. It was first constituted in the United States in the state of Rhode Island, and... It fell into disuse and disappeared for more than a century until it was legitimized by the Grand Council of Allied Masonic Degrees in England and Wales. Currently, in its, in, uh, in its current form, only one degree is conferred. Name that Masonic body. And as a bonus, uh, 
list all 33 uh, titles of the 33 degrees within that degree system nominally and if you get one wrong you get you get no partial credit nothing you <laughs> nothing. get nothing hey i'm the cool teacher i'm just the substitute so hey whatever you want to answer guys yeah you know whatever your heart all, feels i love all of you you're the best and i'll never see you again have some candy <laughs> awesome all right um thanks brother nick appreciate it you guys uh, you, it's, it's super cool to see you again so brother joe anything else you want to add to the final thoughts for this episode no, I think this is awesome. Um, I think this is the first time that Nick and I were on a show together, right? So, um, yeah, man. It is like the multiverse. Yes, different different Earths colliding. Absolutely, right on. Um, yeah, man, awesome show. Uh, I love the conversation. Um, my big takeaway from the book and, and from this conversation is if you ever find yourself being closed-minded, stop what it is you're doing and don't do that anymore. Basically, open-mindedness is the key to not falling into any of these traps, right? And I, I think that our our gentle craft suffers a lot from closed-mindedness. So don't be like that and do the opposite. Peace and love, peace and love. Awesome. Love it. Yep, so there's the book again, The Intelligence Trap, Why Smart People Make Dumb Mistakes by David Robson. <clears throat> All right, so... Let's see. The only thing I wanted to add to that is um, very much what Joe was saying. The first step of a 12-step program is admitting that you have a problem, right? You have to have that intellectual humility. Go Google that. Go Google that term. Uh, there's a lot of literature written up on intellectual humility, which um, it's how you avoid it. It's how you get out of the intelligence trap. We talked a lot about these biases that we all have because we're human beings, but at some point you have to go above that, rise above that and say, I might not know everything and I'm willing to be open to more data. And so that's the only way we can uh, grow as, as individual brothers, grow as a fraternity, grow as a group. And it's dependent on you and all of your, your brothers to, um, you know, to really get out of our comfort zones, try new things and um, really just take this fraternity to the next generation. So um, this has been a great conversation, great book and um, great having brother Nick back on. So Thank you very Ooh. much for watching and keep searching for more light. Have a good night.